wage, the minimum <laughs> wage wasn't $15. It was $6.25. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> That was actually the real minimum wage. There was a student minimum wage that was less than that. It was like $6.15. What? Yeah. It's true. <laughs> Price of everything doubles every 10 years, generally speaking. So a movie ticket cost me five bucks. Like a full movie ticket. Yeah. Now there's like the regular, there's like D-box. Okay, since there's no housekeeping today, we're going to start talking about extreme values of functions. Okay, so one of the main uses of calculus is for asking about extrema on functions, right? So if you have a function that's like supply-demand, you may want to find out what your maximum supply is or something along the lines of this. So there's this notion of optimization in calculus. So the next, or this whole lecture is basically going to be trying to strengthen your algebraic geometry um, connection. Right? Uh, that's, how, that's how we sort of do sort of this curve sketching, by extracting as much algebraic information out of that uh, curve and then trying to draw utilizing that information. So let's just talk about geometry for a bit. If I give you a function that looks like this, <coughs> I give you a function that looks like this, and I sort of just bracket it on this uh, domain, a, b. Uh, does this function over this closed interval have a largest value? Yeah. Where is it obtained? OK, so we can say over or in a, b, this is maximum. Where's the minimum? Here, right? So this is a minimum. in the interval a, b. OK, so this point is called the absolute maximum. The absolute maximum or minimum, because this is, the, this is truly the largest value over the whole interval. There's nothing bigger than it. I can, I can truly say there is no point on the function that is larger than this, and there is no point on the function that is less than this. So if I wanted to give this a, uh, algebraic definition, can anyone sort of give me a guess? Let's do ap, uh, absolute maximum first. So suppose f is a function. Uh, and d is in the domain of f, uh, and d is an interval, a, b. We say f has a maximum, or has an absolute maximum when what? Can anyone codify a statement for me <coughs> which says, and I'll even make it easier. Uh, we say f has an absolute maximum, uh, and I'll even give it a name, uh, at c in d, when what? <coughs> How can we write a statement that says c is the biggest, or at c, we obtain the largest value for f? When f of c is greater than from f of a times b. That's very close, actually, right? So we want to say, you want to say something like f of, we want to show that this is maximum, right? So f of c has to be bigger than or equal to f of x. But for which x is? You said all of them in the domain, right? So I have to say, for every x in this interval, this has to be true. Right, so the way to read this, again, it's just a, I know this is a scary looking symbol, but it just says um, f is a function, and we have an interval a, b. Uh, and so f has an absolute maximum at c in the interval when, for every x in the interval, f evaluated at c is bigger than f evaluated at x. And I guess I should specify, oh no, I did put c in the, c in the interval. OK, we can come up with an equivalent definition for absolute minimum. That's the same setup, but we say for, all, for every x in 
this interval, we need that f of c has to be the smallest member. OK, so let's see if you understood that. So what is the absolute minimum and maximum? <coughs> Whoops. Absolute minimum and maximum of the constant function f of x equals 5. OK, so you have the definitions. What is the biggest and smallest f can be? Yes, sir? All the x's in the domain. Huh? The answer should be like a number. Right? What is the absolute minimum? And What's the vertical of that? Oh, I think what you're trying to say is that it obtains its maximum and minimum at every point in the domain. Yeah. So go one more step. So what is the absolute maximum and minimum? Five. Five. Yeah? <laughs> so we have a constant function that looks like this y equals 5. And I just want to sort of emphasize here that these inequalities aren't strict. See? Less, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. All right, so this actually indicates that you're allowed to be equal to the absolute minimum. Right? So it is indeed the case that at every point of this constant function, that point is both an absolute minimum and an absolute maximum. All right, so that was sort of an over simple example. So here's a question for you. Does the absolute minimum and maximum have to exist? <coughs> Can anyone give me an example where the absolute maximum and minimum do not exist? Yes, sir, back there. Pick one, pick one, yeah. Great. So if we have y equals x squared, you have to give me a domain, though. On what domain doesn't this have a largest or smallest value? Well, the whole thing? On what domain? If I bracket it, if I say it's like this, then it does. Has to be the whole real plane, right? OK, so this is what I'm trying to get at. x squared has no maximum value if uh, d is equal to r, right? because it's going to infinity in both ways. However, as soon as I cut the graph with a, on a, over a closed interval, you absolutely will get absolutely, you definitely will get absolute minimums and maximums as soon as you cut it with an open, uh, with a closed interval. Let's take a little bit more of a look at this, right? So again, here's an example. Uh, so the answer to this is no. Okay. If we look at yx squared for the domain what did I write? 0 to 2. That's the function that looks like this, which goes through from 0, 0 to 0, oh, to 2, 4. And you see here's the largest value and here's the smallest value, absolutely, on that interval. OK, here's where things are going to get a little bit more. OK, so this is the absolute maximum, and this is the absolute minimum. OK, so this is going to be, can you give me an example of a function that doesn't have, uh, I, can you give me an example of a continuous function that does not have an absolute minimum if I close it over a closed interval? Right, that is to say, can you give me an example of any function? So I'm going to say, you have to draw me a line in here. The line has to touch the sides. Right? You can't go off like that. So under those conditions, will, if you draw a line, will that line always have a minimum and maximum? I heard yes, right? Like if it's continuous and in a, in a, like I'll have to do something like this, 
right? Or, you know, it has to go through here and here. Like, so no matter what I try, like I can try making an asymptote, but then that's never going to hit it. Right, so generally speaking, if, if you have to touch the line twice, right, you're going to obtain a maximum and minimum over that interval. Closed, closed regions. Everything will change as soon as I make it open. OK, so what I just said actually has a name. And this is called the extreme value theorem, which I'm just going to abbreviate to EVT. Extreme value theorem. And this says all continuous functions, and I'm just codifying exactly what I stated here. So all continuous functions, f uh, over some interval, obtain both absolute minima and maxima. Namely, there exists two points, x0 and x1, in the interval such that, well, either this point, well, that this point is an absolute uh, minimum, and this point is an absolute maximum. <coughs> OK, but notice, this is a closed interval, closed interval. All right, so you, I want you to now imagine playing that same game where I bracketed a interval on the real line. And imagine now that it's open. Do we still have, what happens to the extreme value theorem if we change that interval to being open? Give it some thought while I wipe down the board. Start with the picture. OK, so let's study a little bit uh, with an example. So I'm going to draw the parabola again. And here's the real line. OK? So if I let the domain be everything, this clearly has no absolute maximum, right? You're going to infinity on both ends. Does this have an absolute minimum over the real line? Where is it? Yeah, at the bottom here, right? So, we, so over d equals the whole real line, uh, 0, 0 is the absolute minimum. OK, I j so what does the extreme value theorem tell me if I like restrict this to a closed interval? Will we then get uh, an absolute maximum and minimum? OK, so I'm going to pick one over here. I'm going to say, let's close this off. Let's restrict the domain now to here. Uh, let's call this uh, a f of a and b f of b. So over d equal a b, do we have a maximum and a minimum? Yeah, over this interval, this is the minimum, absolute minimum, and this is the absolute maximum. So over d equals a b, we have. Uh, a f of a is max, and we have uh, a uh, b f of b is the absolute minimum. I guess I should specify that this is the absolute maximum. OK, so here's the harder question now. So instead of making a closed interval here, what happens if I, use a, if I let this be an open interval? Okay. So now we go up and we start from here, but it's open. And we go to here, open. Do we have a maximum and minimum now? I don't think we have an absolute maximum. 
You don't think. Okay, so let's pull the rest of the class. Okay, so here's a closed interval, and we all agree that there is an absolute minimum and maximum. Yeah, I can point at it. It's here and here. Here's the open interval. So tell me if the maximum, absolute maximum and minimum exist, you'd be, have to be able to tell me where they are. So what's the smallest value in this region? Is there a smallest one? No, I don't think so. Okay, so this is maybe a little bit tricky to think about. Consider this region, 0 to 1, open. What's the largest number in here? One's not in it. Right? One is not in here, and zero is not in here. Right? It's open. Those are the boundaries. Right? So what is the smallest and largest number in this interval? That's the right way of thinking of it. So I'll repeat what he said. He says, geez, you just keep approaching one. So there isn't one. There is no absolute maximum or minimum. If you, pick some, if you pick something that's not one and claim it to be the maximum, I can get closer to one than you. But then you can get closer to one than me. The only thing we can say about this condition is that the maximum point, the absolute maximum, is limiting to one. The absolute minimum is limiting to zero. Right? But they're never actually going to obtain those values. OK, so on closed intervals, because these points are included, we do get absolute minimums and maximums. On open intervals, everything changes. Right? Because now we've changed it from asking, what's the largest and smallest value in that, which is easy to obtain, you just pick the endpoints, to, to choosing what's the minimum and maximum out of this, which is impossible. Right? This is why we need the field of real analysis, because they're the ones who sort of uh, codify that all properly. OK. So there is uh, no absolute min and maximum uh, for, let me just call this uh, d to e, all right, for d equal d to e. Is there any open interval on this where you'll get an absolute minimum or a maximum? What if I pick this one? So here's the parabola. Clearly, the minimum is here. What happens if I choose the open interval here? Do we get an absolute minimum? Yes, we get an absolute minimum despite the fact that it's over an open interval. It's just in the middle. This is fine. It, it actually belongs to the set. Right? It's, not the, it's the endpoints which we have to worry about. So um, note this, right? You can uh, get absolute extrema in open sets. Okay, so we're still doing okay? Cool. Okay, so stuff like this is really special. Okay, so these are open intervals of a function, and they still have absolute minimums and maximums. Okay, so extrema on small, and by what we really mean by this is something that's non-zero, right? We played a little, we played around with these epsilons a little bit when we were doing limits. So extremas on small open domains are called local minima and maxima. You guys know a little bit about locality, yeah? OK, so this, I'm just going to draw you a picture to give you something to do while I wipe down the boards. OK, so I want you to find the maxima, local maxima and minima on this. I'm going to. Put it over a closed interval, A, B. And let me do this. OK, so there's one. OK, so we'll call, we'll call this A. Uh, we'll call this point B. Call this one at C, D, E, F, and G. I want you to classify all of those points for me. 
as being absolute minima, maximum, local, or neither. Okay, what did you guys find out? Where does the absolute minimum occur? Absolute minimum, yeah? Where does the absolute maximum occur? Huh? Yeah, I think this. I could have drawn it better, but this is the absolute maximum because I allowed, we are, this is a closed interval. If I would have opened it up, it would no longer be the absolute maxima. And then, so I guess, the, what's B? Nothing, really, okay? Local maximum, local minimum, local maximum. Actually, this is both local and absolutely the, the maximum. They're both, right? That, right? Because you could be locally the smallest thing, and also globally the smallest thing. Those two things are true at the same time. Absolute, okay, so he asks, are absolute maximums always, do absolute maximums always correspond to a local maximum? Is that true? Just if you close the interval, then it's true. If it's no, no, if you close the interval, it's not true. If you make it under a small interval, then it's local, it's small to think of. So instead of doing this, I could have made some weird, like not differentiable function. Right, so this technically isn't a local maximum. It doesn't have that open behavior around it. If you're on an endpoint, all, all bets are off. What's right? the definition of a local maximum? Okay, let me give it right now. That's a good question. What is the definition of a local maximum? All right, so remember, we want to say that guys like this, this is a local maximum and a local minimum. So I've got to write you down some sort of algebraic description of what geometrically this means. OK, so definition for local maxima. I'll do maxima first, and then I'll do minimum later. OK, so a point, right, so we're going to call these point C and then F of C. A point C, F of C is called a local maxima of f at c when what? Can anyone give me some algebra? Like what do I have to say? I basically have to say if this is a local if this is a local maxima that means that it has to be the biggest thing over some tiny open set that's around it, right? So there if this is a, a local maxima there must exist some open interval around it where that's the biggest thing. Okay, so this may be, this may hurt. Okay, but there has to be an open interval, uh, A, B. Uh, okay, so there has to be A and B in R such that the, this open interval is in the domain of F. And we need that C is in this interval. And we need that uh, f of x is less than or equal to, oh, I have, yes, f of C for every x in the interval. So I'll say it again, right? I'm basically just codifying this statement. If this is an absolute maximum <coughs> that resides at C, F of C, then down here on the line, there has to be some open set going from A to B where this is the biggest thing in that set. 
right? Because re remember, you don't. You, we could have stuff like this, okay? Uh, this isn't the biggest guy over this open set, but it is the biggest guy over this open set. So it doesn't have to be true about all open sets, just one that's close to it. This is what this is the notion of locality. All right, so that's all that this says, right? A point C, F of C, is called a local maximum. It satisfies this condition. When there is A and B, these A and Bs, such that this interval is in the domain of F, and the point that we're looking at is in between A and B, and it satisfies this condition, right? No matter where you pick here, this point is going to be the largest. So the endpoints can never be local, max or miss, because there's nothing? The endpoint can't be local max or min because you need an open interval around it. And the endpoint, you won't be able to get that. OK, so I'll just give you the one for uh, local minimum. It's all the same stuff, except this condition becomes uh, for every x in the interval. We need for c to be less than or equal to f of x. OK, so the next thing I want to uh, sort of investigate <coughs> So in science, we're very interested in finding these points. Right? These points in the real world correspond to like nice equilibria or solutions to equations. So we'd like to be able to find them. So let's try to characterize their behavior. Let's look at tangent lines in particular. What's the tangent at, the, at this absolute minimum? Zero. Uh, well, I guess you're saying the slope, the slope is, is zero. So the tangent is horizontal. The slope is zero. The tangent isn't zero, because zero <coughs> is this line. Right? Be careful how we say it. I know what you're trying to say, but it's technically not correct. Uh, what about here? What's true at this absolute minimum about the tangent? It is horizontal as well. Also horizontal. What about here? Yeah, I think you're getting the point, right? So this is a geometric observation, right? That any of these local minim minima or maxima actually seem to only occur when the tangent goes horizontal. That seems very sensible. Uh, that's actually a theorem. You probably, been, like, you probably know the definition of critical point, yeah? Right, critical point being where the tangent goes flat like that. But why? Why is it the case? It can, yes, but it doesn't have to be. So that, one, it's not, right? that one, the derivative, doesn't even exist. I didn't draw you the other end of the, uh, of the plot. Only the left derivative exists. All right, so this is about finding extrema. Because right, it's very easy to find them on a graph. So here's a theorem, and we're going to actually talk about it and prove it. But this theorem says that if we have the point on the graph C, F of C, and it is a local extrema, so if this point is a local extrema, do you guys know what I mean when I say extrema? So we have maximum and minimums. Uh, the plural of that is minima and maxima. And both of those terms collectively are extremes. right? So minimum is an extreme. A maximum is an extreme. Collectively, there are extrema. So if I say extrema, what I'm really trying to say is it, ha it has a local minimum or local maximum. It's one of them. So see, if this point is a local extrema, then it has to be the case that the derivative of f with uh, evaluated at c is 0. Right, this is getting close to what you're trying to talk about um, critical points. Do you think we can prove this? Or do you want to prove it? Or do you want me to skip it? I do have the proof. You want to skip it? The, you want to skip the proof. Why? Don't you care about why this works? Well, this is, this is troubling to me. Like, why don't you want to know why it works? 
Like, how are you going to use a tool if you don't know why it works? You're going to screw it up. Right? Unless you have an idea of where something came from, it's going to seem like you're just sort of just doing intellectual masturbation. Right? Like everything that I've taught you, like I basically work out the night before from my memory of like the rules of calculus. I'm not like just pulling it out from the book. I can like genuinely re-derive uh, all of this. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll give you an English description of the proof, and I won't give you the details of the proof. Okay, but the details of the proof are in the notes then if you care about it. But Okay, so what we're basically trying to prove is this. I'm going to put proof in quotes, because this really isn't a proof. We sort of want to demonstrate that uh, at points like this, that line has to be flat, right? So the assumption is here, like the precondition is we, we assume that this point here, C, f of C, is an absolute maximum, yeah? So this implies that there has to be some interval such that c is in this interval, and uh, for every x in the interval, you have that the function is smaller than f of c. OK? So given this assumption, we can actually talk about this limit as h goes to 0. So I want to actually just investigate the slope tangent here. So that's going to be um, f of c plus h minus f of c over h. And then we just argue like this. OK, so I know if c uh, is, is in this interval, right? So as long as h gets close enough, uh, c plus h should be in this interval. Like We've bracketed c with some tiny, here's c. Right? There's the open interval around it. So c plus h, if h is small enough, will be inside there. So we know that f of c is the largest thing over this interval, which means that what's the sign of this? f of c plus h minus f of c. Think again, right? This was the biggest, uh, this is the biggest thing in the interval. Maximum, this is a maximum. Negative, right? This is always negative, right? Because this is the biggest thing in the interval. What about h? h is going to 0, right? So from the uh, right-hand side, this is going to be positive, yeah? No, negative, negative, right? Because this will be negative, and this will be positive, right? As h goes to 0 from the right. As h goes to 0 from the left, well, this is still going to be negative, and this bottom is going to be negative. Do you agree? I'm just talking about the signs of this. Right? If this is the maximum over the interval, the top has to be negative and all evaluation points near it. This is going to be positive if we approach 0 from the right and negative if we approach it from the left. Therefore, the right limit is uh, greater than or equal to 0, and the left limit is less than or equal to 0. So what's the only thing the limit can be in that case? 0. OK, so we use this sort of analysis of the signs to say that it both has to be strictly, uh, well, I'll just write it fake here. Limit of h goes to 0 from the right has to be ne uh, less than or equal to 0. Limit of h goes to 0 from the left has to be less than or, uh, greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, the limit itself is going to be 0. Right? So there, we've done it. At any of these critical points, uh, this line has to be 0. Right, just because we're able to find the limit in, in both of these cases and use this sort of clever analysis. Now, hopefully that's enough detail. But like, you need to know these details, right? because that's what's happening. You're saying, look, if you're really locally the biggest thing, there should be stuff around you, and everything around you should be a little bit smaller than you. And under those conditions, I can demonstrate that the limit will be horizontal here. Right? But there really is reasons why the, that derivative is giving us the local minimum and maximum, even though it is pretty clear from the geometry of it. But if I ever asked you to prove something, you need this. So everyone in real analysis, this is basically all they're doing. And this is the stuff that you get to skip. Yeah? If you were to ever ask us to prove something, so you'd ask us to prove I won't. Oh. I won't. Okay. It's well, well beyond this course. 
this course. But it, technically speaking, is something that you need to demand when you're studying math. Right? You told me this is a rule, you have to demonstrate it. Like, we're not deities who are just showing you math rules. They have to come from somewhere. And usually knowing where they come from helps you use the tool itself. Okay. What's the oldest board? Is it this? Yeah. Take that picture for me off. So again, this is just helping you strengthen your geometric algebraic relationship. Because these derivatives are just telling you about the behavior of functions without ever having to look at them or generating them with the computer. OK, so take a look at that proof. It's a lot more fleshed out. Uh, at this point now, we can give a definition for a, what a critical point is. Uh, and we're going to give it a name because I don't want to say 100 times where the derivative is 0 or where the tangent is horizontal. In mathematics, if we use something a lot, we have to give it a name. Right, so a point C, F of C is called the critical point. Uh, when f prime of c is 0 or undefined. Why do we need this second piece? We didn't, we didn't talk about it. OK, so I'm going to convince you that we do need it to both be undefined and 0. So here's your first example. Tell me about this function. y equals x cubed. Does it have a critical point? There's the definition of a critical point. This is a function. Tell me if it has the critical point. OK, so what, what's the first thing that we should do? Problem she got the derivative of this, right? So y prime is equal to 3x squared. This means that y prime is 0 when x is 0, right? So I found a point where the derivative is 0, or where the tangent goes flat. OK? So is it a critical point? Does it satisfy this definition? Yes. Then it's a critical point, right? It's as simple as that. Don't overthink it. The thing that you may be missing here is that um, the tangent does actually go flat, right? It goes like this, and then goes like this, right? So you have tangents like that, and here it's flat. You don't need this to have a flat tangent. Right? That's, that's the other reason we need to have a uh, sort of a wider definition for critical points. So don't get tricked. The critical point doesn't mean Right, necessarily that you found one of these absolute maxima. It's just saying that's where the uh, derivative goes zero. So we do have flat tangent there. OK, so we determined that this is a critical point. So 0, 0 is a critical point. All right, so you're now comfortable with these types of uh, turning points as critical. So what about this function here? This is y is equal to some fractional power, a third. Does it have a critical point? Well, let's first suss it out geometrically, right? So this turning point here is like very similar to this turning point here. So geometrically, it seems sensible if we're saying that this is a critical point that this should be a critical point. So let's take the derivative of this. You get y prime is equal to 1 third, uh, 1 over x to the 2 thirds. So this is 0 nowhere. So, but what is it at 0? Now this is undefined at x equals 0, correct? Can't divide by 0, it's out of its domain. OK, so that's why we have to include these undefined uh, points as critical. right? Because if this is critical, 
then geometrically speaking, this should be critical as well. So this is 0, 0 is critical. So don't be caught by this. You're not looking for necessarily for these local extrema. Huh? Of this function? More or less, yeah. How is there, like, how is this, it like, looks like it's continuous, but it's going Looks like it's, it's, what, this? Yeah. This is the graph of this. Yeah, okay. This is the derivative of the graph, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little uh, exercise here, just so I can wipe down the board. Um, so here's your example. Okay. Find all max and min on, hopefully I can write this, uh, f of x is equal to 10x times 2 minus ln x on the closed interval 1 through e squared. Okay, so given that I've closed off the interval, you're, what can you tell me about what you're going to find? Are you definitely going to find minimums and maximums? Well, as long as this is continuous over that domain, which is it. So give that one a try. Find all the maximum minimums on this, which includes having to look at the critical points. Okay, so strictly speaking, the easiest way to answer these questions would be to run off to Desmos and plot it. But you don't have that ability on a test, right? We also may not have that ability if the function that we're looking at is like a super complicated function. So it's good to try to extract information out using other tools. Okay, so here's our, uh, here's our function, right? f of x is equal to 10 of x. 2 minus ln of x. OK, so let's, let's take a look at this. What's the domain? Uh, OK, so we want this to be over 1 e squared. OK, so what can you tell me about this function? Well, what's its smallest value? over the interval. So I guess ln of 1 is 0. OK, so let's do this. Let's evaluate the endpoints. So we have the point 1, f of 1, which is equal to 1, uh, 10 times 1 times 2 minus ln of 1, which is what? This is 1 and this is 0. So t wait, is ln of 1 0? Yes, so 2 minus 0 is, OK, so this is going to be 120. And then the other endpoint, e squared, uh, 2 minus 0 is 2 times 10 is 20. Uh, e squared, f of e squared is going to be what? e squared, and then 10 e squared, 2 minus uh, 2 ln e, which is 2. So actually, this point is e squared 0. So I'm just going to try to start just keeping track of what we have. right? So we have e, or we have 1. We have e squared. We know at 1, we're at 20. So we got this. We know at e squared, we're at 0. OK. OK, so what, what other options do we have for local extrema then? Are we done? Do we only have to check the endpoints? Right, like anything could happen in here. Like we could have this behavior, we could have that. We don't know. We don't have a picture of the function. So we got to continue. So what are the critical points of this guy? Well, uh, f prime of x is chain rule, our product rule. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, which happens to be minus 1 over x. So what do we get here? We get uh, 20 
minus 10 ln x plus, oops, minus 10. Uh, so when is this 0? So f prime of x is 0 uh, when uh, 20 minus 10 is 10, when that is equal to 10 ln x, which means that uh, ln x has to be equal to 0, or sorry, 1, which means x is e. OK, so we know that this is a critical point by definition. Right, so we know at some point at e, Right, that this point is going to be critical, so we have to check it. Right, because it, it may be the highest or lowest part. Who knows? So let's check what the value of this function is at e. So if I put e into here, what do I get? I get uh, 10 e 2 minus ln e, which is 1. Right, so 2 minus 1 is 1. So what we're left with is 10 e. So. Uh, we get e, 10 e. OK. How did I know to put this dot above this dot? E is a little bit more than 2, right? So that means 10 times e is a little bit more than 20. So that's how you got to sort of think like this. You don't really need to compute it. You just need to know if it's bigger or smaller. OK, so tell me about these points. What is this? Okay, let's start easier. What is this? Absolute minimum. Absolute minimum. What's this? Absolute, Absolute maximum, maximum and local. local maximum. What about this? Nothing. nothing. Right, it could be nothing. All right, so this is nothing. Nothing special. This is absolute and local maximum. Uh, and then this guy is the uh, absolute minimum. OK, exercise. Well, I wipe down the board. Actually, the rest is exercise. OK, so I'm going to write some exercises on the board. What time is it? I'll give you guys a 10-minute break. Uh, so break, talk, coffee. Uh, I'll write you some questions on the board, and then we'll recommence. So this is all a rehashing of stuff, eh? Well, I actually never took fucking high school. Okay. Check Piazza? No, Piazza. Oh, they're on. They're on Piazza. I, yeah, I hate Quirkus. Piazza is always most up to date. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd let you take a picture, but the the like the scan is going to be a higher quality copy. Yeah.
Hello again. Yeah. One second. Let me go turn off my video. Still another lecture. I'm not done. I'm going to give you another lecture. Just a break. You can go. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to change. I'm just saying. We're not done.